Oh, you Pat, it's very nice to see you. Happy, um, where are we? Happy Wednesday, happy Armageddon <laughs> 3, all that kind of thing. Um, thank you for coming to have a chat. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. I'm good. You know, it's uh, you know, busy times, but it's uh, we're privileged to still be playing in these times, so it's great, you know. It's good to see. I like the office as well. Is that um, is yeah, that feng shui? But... Obviously, nice to have a trophy for a touching distance at all times. Yeah, yeah, we were um. High performance centre. I don't think um, when they built it, I said we need a trophy cabinet. They didn't think it would happen that quickly. So uh, they still got to build one in this place. So at the moment, my office gets nicely securely locked. So it's the safest, safest place to be right now. Good. It's good paperweight, isn't it? Yeah. Um, what is really nice about having a 15 minute chat with you, and, and I don't often get the chance to do this, but I'd love to throw it open to you and, and sort of say, what would you love to chat about? There are so many places we can go with Pat Lamb, whether it's talking about Bristol or your you know, remarkable career or Pacific Island rugby right now or the state of the game in general. Is there anything, is there anything you want to chat about or, or should we just sort of see where we end up? See where we end up, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty relaxed. You know, it's whatever, you know, you know your audience well. So whatever, whatever you want, I can talk about anything. So it's over to you, mate. Completely over to you. I'm comfortable here. Good on you. How is life at Bristol at the moment? Where are you in your, your to-do list? And, um, you know, how are you feeling about life as head coach? Well, in Bristol, I mean, I'm really enjoying it. And, and probably what I'm enjoying, people go, oh, it's a good season this year. And I say, well, it's not like it's suddenly a season. It's it's a, it's a journey from when we first came in. And it's a, an area similar to when I went to Connacht and similar after when I got sacked. I said, I wouldn't take these jobs anymore until I'm got clarity and of what they want and the plan and they got clarity of the plan and how Patland works and once you get that clear and it's absolutely clear then everything becomes very easy we've got vision leadership and you know making decisions on achieving that vision keeps everyone accountable and then you work away and you know I had just after after the game of Gloucester I made all the teams sit right all those who joined me in 2017 come to the front of the room all those who came in the following year here that's it, and the fourth year and all your new guys at the back and then stand up and all the guys stood up who played on the weekend predominantly our squad is really strong in the first two years and that was all part of the plan because build relationships uh, build culture they start driving it everything but it also becomes a uh, made me realize that we can't get complacent i said so some other guys like I used Shapara as an example. As he only played 20 minutes, got injured. He played a fantastic 20, but I showed a clip. I said, look what, uh, you know, Noel's only been here with us 20 minutes. Uh, sorry, six weeks. Look at that ball presentation he did. Why did he do go there outside, put the ball there? It's what we train. What's funny, some of you guys in the front here, you know there's a message different. So what, why are you suddenly not doing? Are we getting complacent? Are we getting complacent leaving things around this place? Are we getting complacent? Um, and it was all geared to where we've been probably performing in the last couple of weeks, you know, where I've, I've noticed a slip. So um, so on this journey, it's uh, as I'm trying to get these guys to understand, it's not a new one every year. It's we build and we keep climbing and we keep climbing. And unfortunately, because I set the goals, or fortunately, I set the goal every year pretty high. Um, it forces me to uh, ask the hard questions on myself and everybody here because... Um, if we're not improving, unfortunately, we need to move because as we've seen with even the football team recently and people will lose their jobs if we don't perform. Our only concern currency is performance. So it's important we look at everything. So where am I in Bristol? You... I'm enjoying it. We're in a good place, but we've got a long way to go. Yeah, sure. Um, so what is the goal for this season? What did you write on the whiteboard on day one? Well, so every year, the first year, um, the first year didn't count. I put the five-year plan, but when I formed this plan, uh, they were in the premiership. When I arrived six months later, they got relegated. So first num plan got put aside. Number one, got to get to the out of the championship and get into premiership, which we did. And then we started, first year was all around staying in the premiership as far as the bottom line is. Now, don't get me wrong, the internal goal was top six, and we just missed out. We ended up in ninth. But we're only four points off um, the the top six. Then um, last year was all about top six was the bottom line. Seventh wouldn't have been any good, um, even though it would have been an improvement. Would, um, and we hit third. This year's bottom line is um, top four, so you got to make the playoffs. Um, fifth is no good. Um, and but I'm talking bottom line because when I say top six or top four, that can be four, three, two, or one. Um, 
and you know next year that goes higher so it forces me to look make sure we got the right people the right support around them got clarity and judge performance players staff myself um on that sort of level because i'm looking at it going well we could keep this player we could keep this staff member but i don't think it'll take us to the next level you know because of what i'm seeing and what we're trying and we're not getting at all i think that person there could take us to the next level whether that's a staff member or player so and uh when you get sacked you realize you have to make those calls it's not easy but you make it on the regards on we're trying to get to because uh early in my coaching career i protected people because i was worried about their family situation and worried about you know i don't want to make that call on them this is difficult hey pat lamb got sacked those people carried on so it's a good lesson when you get sacked it was a blessing because it makes you ask the hard questions and put the performance, which is ultimately what it's about, at front and centre. Which is which is brilliant. I mean, so much of this actually, and we've worked together on, on television a couple of times, the way that you set your stall out is, is very inspiring. And it, it's very easy, just from a complete outsider, to, to see why it works. I just wondered, another person who, who I worked with a lot at Sky was Dean Ryan, your old teammate, and he used to talk a lot about how much fun you had, particularly at Newcastle in the championship winning year. And it, it just sounded, I mean, it sounded proper sort of rock star rugby. I just wonder when you set and you build your plan, you know, do you, do you put fun on that list or is that just a byproduct of success? Fun is uh, ultimately the real, real, real fun. Uh, like let's get everyone involved in rugby is passionate about the game. If you have to be to be at this level. Um, but really if you dig it down, fun's not, drinking beers and, and partying and stuff, because you actually can do that with anybody, you know? And we're not yeah. building relationships because we need best friends, because the reality is the closest people to us are the people, whether it's your partners or the people, your brothers, people you've come through all your life. Those are the real close people that, but why do we build those relationships to get them strong? Is so that we actually can challenge when times that when we're under pressure, it's more the times under pressure that we can be honest, we can call things out and people aren't taking it personal. That's why I say, like, you know, honestly, my wife, when, when I've annoyed my wife and the way she talks to me, she will, ne not one other person on this earth she'll talk to the way she talks to me when she's really upset with me. I see that as a privilege. I see that as a privilege. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, me and her are like this, that she feels yeah. that she can truly say it as, as a person. That's why I say the guys here. <laughs> When they say, oh, me and my girlfriend, we don't argue. We don't, I said, mate, and all that means is you're not really being truthful. You're not really talking and saying how you feel. You know, and that's what I say to the guys here. When we're at a stage where our relationship is so strong that we can challenge things, we improve. We improve fast. And um, and that's what it's about. And then what ends up happening, winning trophies is fun. You know, like I've been in session, like, don't get me wrong, after in Toulon, uh, Toulouse when we beat Toulon, uh, sorry, in Toulon in France, we won this trophy for the first time. For, and a lot of guys, first times, it was COVID, we're back in the hotel, the beers, the champagne were flowing. Now I've been in these sort of situations many times, you know, where it happens, but the ones that stand out and the best enjoyable times is when you win these trophies. Because what you're enjoying is the sacrifice, the hard work that everyone put in to come together to achieve that. Whereas I've had these times just in other teams and it's just, yeah, okay. It's, you know, and there's a real definition of fun is um, you know at the elite level, it's it's fun doing things that are difficult, and you put the work into it. It's like when you get an ex like I I didn't like school, but geez, I had a lot of fun when I got the right results, and you're getting your results, and you and you get qualified to become a school teacher. It's like that is fun. It was hard work. I'm I'm taking notes here, and I'm definitely going to use the line with my wife. What a privilege it is to take yet another bollocking from you when it comes my way. <laughs> Pat Lamb said. Yeah. Um, who inspires you? Where Where do you find? Do you, do you read a lot? Do you watch a lot? Where, where do you find inspiration yeah, I, in your role? I mean, all, all, all over the place. I, like when I was young, I used to say, you know, Brian Williams, uh, you know, because um, you know, as a Sam Warner's pioneer and. Uh, what he achieved and then getting to know him as a man and then you know obviously there's people that you come but ultimately what I, I love people who go through adversity and come out the other end you know because that's what life's about and you know and what people are able to achieve I mean obviously the Michael Jordan was massive uh, and was massive for the team and funny enough I played the replayed the video to the guys 
you know, when he talks about um, having to call guys out and he pushed hard, people thought he was a tyrant and some, but he said because he wanted to win, but he wanted people to win too and go to places where some of these guys haven't been before. And they might feel that, but at the end of the day, some of them are sitting with three rings, four, four championships on the back of Michael Jordan doing what he did. Um, I, I admire that stuff. We um, we showed a clip today, and um, um, Omar Monome, um, uh, you know, the defense and collision coach uh, from the NFL on Luke uh, Chukli, I think it is. Uh, and there was a clip, a two minute clip about him being the best defensive um, linebacker, but it showed his analysis and the work he put in and the talk and the vibe. And initially, you're looking at a guy, best defensive, must be all his hits, but no, it's his planning, his organization, and the way that he could get all the guys around him to defend. And he, he made these plays because he'd done the homework. He made the game look slow because he saw everything. And it's exactly what we've been talking about. So I put that up as a bit of inspiration. So, you know, talking to people, even people's stories that come, you know, even in COVID, there's some, there's some amazing stories that have um, uh, people have been through. So you're looking for those moments where people have come through adversity and that's inspirational. Yeah. Um, I still sort of want to go two different directions. I, I'm going to pick the Connacht thing as well, because one of the themes throughout your career is, is silverware and success. And I just wonder now, you know, you're, you're on that journey with Bristol and it's, it's beginning to re, uh, pay dividends. But how do you reflect on the journey of, of what you did with Connacht and becoming Pro 12 champions and that remarkable day at Murrayfield? Absolute highlight, because if I did what I did, if I did this journey first, people will go, oh, well, Steve Lansdowne, he's a billionaire. He's got all the resources and so forth. But funny enough, we don't actually have Steve's money. <laughs> we don't have his mm -hmm. billions. We have the salary cap. Um, but, you know, naturally, you know, it allows us certainly when we can bring bigger players in here. But those players aren't coming because they're big players. They're coming because of the vision. So the template I'm using here is no different from the Connick template. And the reason why is my coaching highlight, because we had, out of all the three European competitions, you know, the Pro 12 at the time, Pro 14, the um, uh, the Premiership, and also the Top 14, we had the lowest budget of, uh, of all. But what we did, it became a truly team thing, which is what I'm doing here, is that I don't, we're not going to be reliant on any individual, including myself. We put structures, systems, we, we work out, that's the plan. Uh, that's the goal or the vision. This is the plan and how we're going to do this. And then ultimately, everyone's going to be accountable to step up. And you don't have to. You can, it's, it's a choice. If you don't want to do it. But what we managed to achieve showed what you can do if you work together. Absolutely work together. And what we're doing now is exactly the same. And I'm putting a massive emphasis. Like I've been disappointed like with the team last week and the last couple of weeks because I said to your fellas, don't get me wrong, culturally we are strong and getting strong because what's saving us is our defense. Boys are working hard on D. But what that means is if you, you know, as a commentator, you know, they never comment on uh, players individually on defense unless they put a massive hit in. But when a team's defending and defending, they what they comment on, oh, Bristol's defense is good or England's defense is good. They make comments on individuals on attack, though. And they do amazing things like, you know, Reese Zammer did on the weekend. They go, oh, well. But the thing is, that has no value to me, really, because that's it's what people, what we value is what it takes from a team to create that opportunity. You know, like uh, it took Callum Sheedy to get that ball, call for that ball, and play Willis Taloharo at the back, but play flat of the line, which Willis's line, which put Reese into a position that he could actually run and put the kick through. So it's noticing all of those things. And the danger, um, is that players, when you get living in the headlights of, oh, how wonderful Bristol Bears and all this and playing, oh, they should be internationals. There is the tendency for players to drop out of that team factor and go into me factor <laughs> because of contracts, because of, and trying to keep the players away from that and keep them accountable. Fellas, we got here because of the team and we stay here at the top by being as a team. And I won't allow people to get... Uh, carried away with individual uh, stuff and everything we do is about us as the bears not as as individuals and um, yeah so we don't, I don't keep I don't really care who scored tries all I look at is Bristol Spears have called this amount of tries I don't want to know who scored them because it's not it's irrelevant it's the team try that we had what do you make of I suppose the state of the game at the moment you know are, are you we're seeing teams doing very, very different things, almost sort of like everything in life. It's sort of the polar opposite. There's those teams that want the ball and those that don't. 
which one is winning in your view? I think the biggest thing is coaches' philosophies. Like for me, I don't, I, I'm not a big believer that, oh, this is a bigger game. This is a tougher level. No, it's a game of rugby, you know, and ultimately you create the pressure you want to put on it. So when I go into like, we, you know, I would go back to the Connick. Leinster, Connick's first final playing Leinster, all the Irish team in there, these guys have been in eight, 10, whatever finals. No way they're kind of going to win. For me, to the boys, fellas, it's a game of rugby. You know, we've worked as a team. We know what we've got to do. We're here because of the work we've done. Go and enjoy yourselves. Go and celebrate. Let's celebrate the work we've done during the week. It's the same, you know, first time we're playing Toulon in a final. Bristol haven't been the biggest trophy ever. There's no different. I was watching that team and the Connick team. It's no different. So, I mean, I've been fortunate to be in as a player and coach at the different levels. It's just the game. It really is. It's 15 guys, but we, but media, fans, I understand the nature of the game. It's the Six Nations. It's, oh, it's not as big as the Autumn Nations. It's not as big as the World Cup. But that's, it's still the game of rugby. It's not a different game. So your philosophy, and the biggest thing is, I don't like to bring the, I believe i got a game that can beat anybody. Now I'm talking about the structures of the game. So I do I have a system to beat that on defense or attack? Yeah. But I need the players to be able to play the game. And what that means is I'll never bring the game down to the players. So for instance, let's say your team can't tackle. You know, you get coaches, oh, we'll move them, we'll start them over here. No, you need to start tackling. You can't tackle, great. I need a good coach to improve your tackle technique and which gives you the confidence to do it. All right, I need the hookers out in the middle of the prop. He's, uh, we want to go, oh, how do we, no, sorry, prop has to pass. I mean, I, I love it here. The amount of front type five forwards I've had, uh, they connect in here, they go, oh my gosh, I never asked to pass. I normally have to stay out of it. No, if you want to survive, pass. So that means the magic happens is the quality of the coaching staff. I'm looking for guys who have really good rapport, they have, you know, really good coaches. And I'm looking for coachable, highly motivated players who want to win trophies, who want to play international rugby. Bring that together, magic happens. So when a coach turns around to me and goes, oh, that player, he, he can't do it. And I know he's so keen and willing. The issue's with the coach, not the player. You know. Whereas if a coach is doing everything and a player's turning around going, oh, actually, I don't, I, don't um, oh, I, I think I should do it this way. He's the problem. Time to get rid of him. So... If I went to my template of the game, it's more, of course, there's different ways you factor in the weather and so forth. But the biggest thing is take away the fear. But the only way you do that is certainty of your role, certainty of the game plan and certainty of your skill level to be able to achieve it. And that's what all the training sessions are about. Because I've, I've not, you can do a certain style that will win your games, but you need to win, to be the best. To win a World Cup, you yeah. need to be the best to win the Six Nations. So you might have games, oh, we might win two or three, and but I'm not happy with mediocre. You know, I'm not happy to be, oh, well, that's why when I got here and people talking about now, ask, well, what do you think about ring fencing? You know, I really don't care about ring fencing. This is not, it doesn't affect us. I said when I arrived, I don't want to talk about relegation ever again because everyone was going to go, oh, we can't get relegated. Leave that for outside. We're going towards being the best. That's the goal. So don't worry about relegation. Don't worry about ring fencing. It doesn't bother us as a team. It's interesting that you talk about winning World Cups and winning Six Nations. How, you're obviously on a journey at the moment, and there's a, there's a lot to do. But how excited would you be to take your game plan and your template to the international sphere? And how big an ambition is that? It used to be an ambition when I first got into coaching, but what I quickly realised after getting sacked from the Blues, because I jumped in, that's the only job that I jumped into without having to do an interview. They just offered me, gave me a massive pay rise, said, coach, this is my home team, super rugby, great. Um, but they did it on the back of my success with Auckland in the uh, NPC Mitre 10 Cup, where we uh, were very successful, and they gave me that job. But when I got into the job, I went, right, here we go. And I thought, hold on, what's going on here? What's going on here? Well, don't worry about that. You just want to worry about the team. But well, all of that stuff that I have no control over affects what we're doing. So I said that I'll never go in until I know clarity on vision. So if I went to, let's say, you know, the opportunity came to coach an international team. First thing I'll ask, well, what do you want to achieve? Now, if they don't want to be the best, if they don't want to win a World Cup, if they want to, they want to be number one, then I probably won't take the job. Um, I wouldn't just say, oh, well, we're going to do international because it's international rugby. I'm not interested in that. And then the next thing that I'd say, well, this is how I'm going to do it. If you if you want to be the best in the world. So give me a country as an, give, give me an example of a country. Give me an, you give me a country. England. All right. England. So my, my first thing, if it was England, what is your vision? 
what I want them to be able to tell me is that we want to be the best country, number one in the world. We're going to win World Cups and we're going to be dominant. That's what I want to hear. If they say, oh, you know, we just want to improve, oh, thanks, I won't take the job. But the next thing, which is most important, is that I'd give them the plan on how we're going to do this, all right? And most importantly, I want to make sure that I have the control over the game, everything to do with the game, the culture and the leadership of the whole place. Because everyone has to be accountable. Um, because everyone's actions affect us being able to achieve that. So what that means is, like, I don't, you know, hire, it, it's more around everyone. If we set us, um, uh, our um, culture and our standards and everything, everyone is accountable to it. You know, whether you're the, at the front office reception or whether you are, you know, um, the captain of the team, everyone comes under the same umbrella um, as we go through. If we got agreement on that, then I'd, I'd love to be able to do it. But I wouldn't do it just because, oh, it's the England job or it's the All Black job or it's the Welsh job or whatever it is. Um, and then, most importantly, it's the same principle. All right, you've got players and let's say it's England, you've got Owen Farrell has to be just as hungry as a Harry Randall to be better, you know, and want and coachable and motivated to be better. It doesn't matter who it is. And Richie McCaw is a great example of that when you think about in London, um, before the his second World Cup final, he was the only person, maybe his wife and his parents that knew this was going to be his last game. He was still doing mm -hmm. skill work after training. What does that tell you? That a little plenty of excuses not to, but he was trying to get better right up to the last moment of his game. And he won, you know, his only captain to lift it twice and look at his career since outside of rugby. It's just the nature of who he is. So that's what you want. You want the right players, the right coaching staff, the right management team, but more importantly, a country that wants to have high ambition. I wonder if there are people in the corner office in TW2 leafing through the diary to 2023 and just jotting things in. We shall see who'd, who'd, who'd found those flames. What, one thing I do want to ask you, what, what do you make of the media in this country? I mean, there's a good man in place at the moment who's copping a lot. Um, and I don't know whether that's COVID and it's the fact that we've all been locked up for 12 months but do you do you do you do you mind that sort of heat when it comes on I presume when you when you were in that blues role you know we know what the, the, the Kiwi press can be like at times do you, do you mind that kind of thing or is it just part uh, and parcel like, of the job it, it is it, everyone's got a job to do and every job is important it's the same and you know like that's what I say everyone here everyone has different jobs but no job is more important than the other one because if it, if it wasn't important why do we have that job you know, mm. and the thing to me, like, if we we want our game, we want people to play our game. We want people to be involved in our game. We want, and like, even if you look at the work we do, our vision is inspiring our community for rugby success. Alpha, how do our fans, even particularly in COVID, know what we're doing? All right, that's through our media. That's through people finding it. That's, and and so really, I, I see it's around relationships. So, and it's about making sure that. You know, as you go through, you, you know, there's always people that are trying to get angles. But if you're consistent, I mean, some people probably get bored of listening to Pat Lamb because I'm saying the same thing all the time, generally, because that's what I believe in. It's who I am. But people want what it is. But it's been about it's no, no different about clarity, being honest, being being clear, and you know, saying what you need to say. You don't have to say everything because not not everything is for everybody. And it's about you know understanding. Like I, I always, I. I I, I saw it was always crazy when coaches used to have ban on different people or the media. I don't want to talk to media and all that sort of stuff, mate. They're only doing their job, they, you know, and it's about you. Uh, that's part of the job, but you build a relationship and you're trying and, and, and you're all on the same picture because they need a story. But what you want that story to be is give people as much clarity as you can. Um, going, you know, whether that's an injury situation, a performance situation, or, you know, whatever it is. So it's more about being able to have that relationship. Winning helps as well, I imagine. Winning helps. Yeah, and also, um, not, and also not taking it, like, as I say to the players, fellas, if you if you don't want to listen to all that criticism that people say about your performance, then don't also, on the other hand, take, oh, I'm so good, everyone's telling me I should be in England, or, um, mate, it's, I always say to the guys, do not, I did, and my staff, we shouldn't be taking our self-worth from what people say, you know, it starts from inside and you know, you know whether you're doing a good job. It doesn't matter what other people are saying. Yeah, and a lot of people would do well to buy into that. Um, your career, we, we mentioned that Rockstar Rugby. I love the smile when we mentioned Dean Ryan and those, those great days <laughs> of Newcastle lifting 
Heineken Cup with Northampton, rampaging around for Samoa. I remember the try against Wales in in 99. Does that feel like yesterday or does it feel like another lifetime ago? You know, it's funny. I was, um, I look back at that, a lot of that stuff and I was just blessed, you know, like to have a, a, a career at the high level in amateur days and then to look back and have the professional days. Um, you know, and I think all of us that went through that transition were very, very blessed because we played the game, you know, with, with careers, teaching. I had a young family. And you truly played for the love of the game. And then when I look at the, um, you know, it was a real bonus to get paid. And it was wonderful. It was great. It was when professionalism all came in. But what what, what it did is that it, um, it made me really realize professionalism has nothing to do with money. It's around, you know, how you do, the way you do things. You know, your standards, your attitude towards it. And it's funny. It's come through into, into my coaching. I think a few agents don't like me because I'm all about, when I, um, when I came to Newcastle, I mean, I was offered the money I was offered to come. I thought, fantastic, great, because three times that was worth New Zealand. I was going, that's a lot, lot more than what I'm getting in New Zealand. I arrived in Newcastle and I worked out I was probably one of the lower paid players. But I didn't care because as far as I'm concerned, when I signed that deal, I thought it was a fantastic deal for what I was getting. And no problem. So I came over here full heartedly. Um, and I'm going to give everything because these guys have backed me and I've come over. I didn't care the guy next to me who's not even playing is getting more than me. What I did was perform because I enjoyed it. I got fully invested, found out what Newcastle was about, got to know my mates, Dean Ryan, um, you know, Richard Arnold, um, you know, Johnny, well, all these boys were fantastic. Alan Tate, Armstrong. And, and I got to know them why, because I knew if we're gonna win things, we gotta be, we gotta be tight under pressure. And we had a great time. And, and because I performed, um, I ended up going to, I got a triple contract to Northampton for me and McGeekin. And when I went there, um, it was funny, um, that would never have happened if I hadn't performed. We won the Premiership, got premier, Premiership Player of the Year, and that's why that happened. And then when we won the European Cup, my next contract went up again. And, and that's the, the, the whole thing. Perform, you receive. Perform. And when I was leaving Northampton, I ended up with 20 contracts to choose from. And I ended up going back to Newcastle to finish off. Um, because I knew that I wanted to go there and finish because it didn't finish well the first time and I enjoyed it. But, uh, but, uh, but the whole concept, when a player comes up to me and an agent says to me, well, this player's going to achieve this and this is what he's worth. And I said, he hasn't achieved that, you know? And then they, um, they want more. And I said, well, if you want more on a bonus, what if, you don't, what if you don't get it? If you don't play well, can I take money off? You know, of course, oh, no, no, no. But it's given me a reality. And when they say, oh, well, a player can't do that, I said, well, hold on, my kids are 20 and even trying to get a job, 15 grand is a lot of money for a 20-year-old. You know, salary for a year, and they're saying trying to say, well, twenty grand. It's they can't live on that. And you're in the real world for the experience because you've got kids, you've been through it yourself, and you know, and what a, and you get the right people. There's a lot of people I haven't taken, and people think, well, well, they're blowing the salary cap. They don't realize that a lot of people are here on the fair offer, but they have the opportunity to earn the money if they put the performance in, and that's the way it should be. Very interesting. Um, final question. I'm conscious of your time, and this has been absolutely no fantastic. I but, talk a lot. Sorry. About um, <laughs> no, no, it's brilliant. I, I'd love. We'd love to check in again. I just the, the final question really is. I, I remember hearing stories of how tight you you Newcastle rugby players were, almost with the, the footballers back then, Tino Asprias and David Ginnellas and people like that. I just wonder, was it more fun then than it is now? I think it's. Um... Uh, when I look back at that, that's probably when I talk about, um, you know, uh, game culture and leadership, I, I talk often about, um, you know, I've been blessed to be in these successful teams as a player and as a coach. And I've had, um, you know, like, I feel blessed and fortunate because a lot of good rugby players haven't won trophies. And I've had, um, I've been able to win a few. Um, and, but I've also been very blessed and fortunate to be in some horrific teams that weren't great. But the three things that came away that are non-negotiable, that's why I'm able to look back and go, well, what's the difference? You've got to have a good game. You've got to have a great culture where we respect, we get to know each other because, again, when we're under pressure, and then you also got to have leadership and grow the leadership. So when I think of that, that in Newcastle, you know, we had a very, a lot older team and we had Dottie Ware, Gary Armstrong, um, Tate, uh, Underwood. Popple Rob Wells, Popple though. Popper well, it was an amazing Popper, team. Yeah. yeah. But again, we could have easily just been named, but what we did, we invested into the time we spent together. And because, and then we, as you played, we, what related on the field, because it was old school, it was still rugby was only pretty, 
uh, was pretty new to professionalism, but all a lot of us had achieved things in the amateur days. So we, we, you know, this is us getting bonus, getting paid to do what we like doing. We brought like a barbarians team, if you like. And then when I went to Northampton, who um, I remember hadn't won anything uh, for 120 years, but they had, you know, Ian McGeek and um, they had a lot of internationals there, uh, British Lions. Geech said he brought me there. I'll never forget this. I thought, oh, my rugby ability. He goes, yeah. But he says, no, I brought you here to change the culture in the place. You know, he says, and I knew straight away what he was talking about. You know, there was a little bit cliquey. And we ended up bringing the team together. And, he, and what we did in a different way is that we changed the culture, the way we did things. Obviously, Geech had the game. But the culture was, there was, um, you know, certainly from the play, Geech was trying to run at the whole thing. But within the group, uh, there needed to be some changes. And I was the, the you know, the, the black sheep literally coming in and built relationship with Tim Robber, Matt Dawson and all them. But we got to the point saying, if we're going to believe we're going to make change. We need to get all these academy kids, all these young guys, everyone coming in. So that, because we're going to need them. And probably my greatest story I always talk about that is Don Malone playing in the Heineken Cup final. Dawson got injured, Bramwell got injured. He was like the third or fourth string. And he came in on that game and played the final and played really well. And But he felt comfortable because he'd been involved in the team. Previously, he wouldn't have been involved in anything. You just stay out there because you're not in the main group. Um, and then um, and then we had leadership and we grew. So that formula is massive. That's why you've got to have it. And that's why you do these things. There's, there's a means to an end. So getting together for a barbecue and families and getting to, you know, and presentation getting to know each other is not because we want more friends, it's because we need to as a team to be able to achieve what we want to do on the field. So, um, yeah, but I, I see it the same fund that I'm seeing guys when they lifted that trophy and I saw Siali Piatel, Jordan Crane lift that trophy, you know, Ben Earl, um, you know, Stephen Luatua, you know, remember Stephen, I don't think he's even won anything, um, even in his career. Um, you know, though these boys getting these sort of things is no different the way I saw it. and the way they celebrated with champagne was exactly the same with Dean Ryan was celebrating, that Tim Rodborough was celebrating. Because I always say when we when I see Matt Dawson or I run into uh, Tim Rodborough, we look at each other and straight away, you know, we achieve something together. You know, I mean, all the other rugby guys are important, but you know, everything comes flooding back to what we achieved in 2020. Um, sorry, in the year 2000, these guys have memories now, you know, like um, guys who have left, they, they know when they see each other in 20 years time, they'll know this is what we, yeah. what we did together. You're writing a brilliant chapter at Bristol and your, your story is fabulous. I wish we could talk for so much longer. Perhaps we can chat, chat again or catch up again in a few months time, but no worries, thank you so much. Been really good fun. Look after yourself and your team and um, stay well in, in amongst the chaos. Thanks, Pat. Alex, good man. Cheers, All buddy. Cheers. Bye-bye.